Uh, how are you all doing today? We got a thumbs up. That'll do okay. Uh, I'm all right. It's a great day to not go anywhere. Uh, unfortunately, my life is such that I have to go somewhere. Uh, anyways, uh, today we have a uh, we have a big day for you all today. We should have, yeah, some logistics here. Uh, first, seems like the homework system went okay. Got your homeworks received uh, and uh, it's going through. Uh, the TA and I have been grading them over the weekend, so it seems like it'll come together. We hope to have answers like uh, returned assignments sometime soon, just so you get a sense of how things are going. Yeah, the footpaths, good point about it being ice skating rinks. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to go curling with yourself, um, which is sort of how things are going, or a car. You know, car curling seems to be pretty popular these days. Okay, uh, homework two is due on Friday. I will post homework three hopefully this evening, which will be due next Friday. Uh, I also updated uh, the book with chapter two content on stars. So if you go onto eClass and download a new copy of the PDF, it will have the comments that I've received so far uh, addressed, plus a whole bunch of new things that will, uh, you know, you can read about for your uh, stars and stellar structure excitement. Uh, older uh, results, Constance quiz postponed until February 28th, uh, until after February 28th, and then we'll have an in-class online midterm via e-class. Uh, today we have a bit of a Franken lecture. We are uh, going to finish up the journal article content from Friday, just sort of give you a sense of that, uh, set up for this Friday's observations and data activity. Uh, we'll do a quick wrap up on telescopes and the properties of telescopes. Uh, how we use them to make uh, observations very briefly, and then we'll move into stars. And unlike, uh, say, Astro 320, we are going to do horrible black boxy things to stars to kind of sweep all the details under uh, the rug. So, uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, uh, I think I'm going from this page. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Last time, when we tried this, uh, the internet completely failed me. So I wanted to give you a little introduction to the NASA astrophysics uh, data system uh, before we go in. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and in theory, this should work. Yeah. Is it alive? Hello, great. Okay, I've got the right window and everything. So if you go to that uh, ui.adsabs.harvard.edu, uh, you'll get a website that looks like this with a Google-like search entry in it. And it allows us to look up articles in uh, the way, uh, in various ways. So uh, the way we can do this, we have all these keyword uh, terms that we have here that you can do searches for. Uh, in detail. And I happen to know some of the fields. Here's some great examples down here in the in, in below, search examples. And so if we want to find this Gaia Hertzsprung Russell diagram uh, paper, one of the ways that we can find it is through that DOI uh, that I pointed out last time. We could just type in things that have to do with Hertzsprung Russell and Gaia. And if we hit that in return, we get kind of five articles that feature this. And the one that we want was this Gaia collaboration from Babusio, Van Leeuwen, whatever. There's other ways we could search for it. Um, we have the DOI in the uh, uh, in the DOI in the uh, reference or the journal volume page or the authors that you could look for this Babusio and the Gaia collaboration. All are different ways that we could actually latch on to this article in the literature. I want to give you a little bit of a introduction here uh, to the pieces. This, the aspect ratio seems a little funny to me, so I'm gonna whoop, clip that out like that. Okay. Uh, first off, uh, this is really nice because it includes the abstract, and I think I mentioned to you that the last time the abstract is a really useful way of getting a summary of the data. So if you're like, is this article right for me? You can go ahead and read the abstract here. Uh, something that's a very useful metric for understanding how things work in astrophysics is this idea of citations and references. So citations are all the papers after this paper 
that acknowledge this paper in their content. So if there's a citation in there, it goes ahead and uh, links it to this article so you can find everything in the literature that thinks that this article is important. So if I click on that, it brings up a bunch of articles and then you can see that, oh, something about constraining initial conditions of NGC 2264 using ejected stars found in Gaia DR2. Maybe you could see like, okay, this is the cluster and that article had to do with something in the clusters. So citations are everything that uh, cites it. And then the references are everything in the paper that this uh, article itself cited. So this is the past. The citations are the things that came after this article and thought it was important. And then the references are everything that happened before the article that are included to make this article possible. So this is a great way to find other articles in the literature and that are connected. So you can imagine that these citations and references form this vast web, almost a kind of intellectual genealogy that goes all the way back to the beginning of astrophysics and then will continue moving on with all these different networks of how these papers relate to each other. And this provides a very useful way for astronomers to assess the impact of various articles. If I go back to the previous search results here, you can see that in the search there is a citation count. And those citation counts indicate uh, the number of times that the article has been cited in the literature. And you can see that this article here has way more citations than any of these other articles. And so this is in some ways viewed by the community as a very important article. So it just hops right in here and then we get it. Uh, then the next thing that's really useful is getting the article itself. So usually the best way uh, to do this is to click on the My Institution link. Uh, and this requires you to set up an account with ADS and tell it that you are at the University of Alberta. And then if I hit the My Institution link, that'll pop up. That will pop up our library. And then it connects our library here. And so if you have a journal article subscription to the journal, it connects it and you can get it. And this is useful for these articles that are still kind of behind what's called the paywall, where it's going to uh, ask you to um, pay for the article unless you uh, connect through. Okay, so this has popped up a new window uh, and you can't see it that I am. Ooh, logging in and all that stuff. So that's the quick way to get it. This article is published as open access, which means there is no paywall. And so if you just click on that little PDF link right there, that'll pop up and load the PDF of the article, which is very slow, but boom, PDF of the article. And then the final piece is that there is a link. If the article is in the archive, this takes you straight to the archive page. And so this will put it in here, and then you can grab PDFs here. Remembering that the archive version is the kind of freely uh, posted version by the authors, and then the journal article is the thing that's actually published by the uh, journal. Uh, any questions on that so far? Oh, question came up on a different channel. Is the class being recorded? Yeah. So just for reference, I post all of our uh, lectures to uh, eClass and to uh, the, oh, you don't need to see that I had that editing off. But uh, first off, we have um, this Yuja videos uh, right here. So all the article, all, all the lectures are there, or I've been posting them because it's just me yammering uh, to a YouTube playlist. So if you want to, I find YouTube to be just sort of an easier way uh, to uh, see the lecture recordings. Um, the Yuja player is eh, plus minus. Okay, uh, are there any other questions about using the ADS interface? I haven't checked. Yep. All right. Oops. Yeah. Cool. Everybody's got it. Uh, all right. Um, cool. So moving back to yeah. Um, we talked about the MRAD structure and everything, and last we spoke. We were talking about uh, this thing that came up in the lecture called extinction. 
And we haven't really discussed extinction yet, but it's an extinction is a vital part of understanding observations in space because uh, stars aren't the only thing in our galaxy. There's all this other stuff like this gas and dust in between the stars that we call the interstellar medium. Medium just means it's, you know, the stuff. And interstellar means it's between the stars. So literally the interstellar medium consists of everything in a galaxy that isn't stars or dark matter. So that's kind of a catch-all garbage uh, can for collecting everything. I study the interstellar medium, so it's, you know, my favorite part of galaxies. Uh, but this talks about extinction, and extinction is part of the interstellar medium. But what is extinction? Well, extinction and reddening we'll dive into later when we get into the coverage of the actual interstellar medium. But for right now, it suffices to note that uh, the extinction reddening comes from this stuff that's called dust. And I like to think of dust more like soot. It's this gritty, dark carbon uh, material. Uh, here's a little grain uh, from interstellar dust that wafted into our solar system and was collected by a satellite and returned to us. Um, it's micron-sized little grains of carbon or silicates, uh, you know, just crud in between the space. It's uh, the product of high mass star or any, actually any mass star at the end of light, Fred giants and thermal pulsation asymptotic giant branch stars throw off their outer layers, including uh, some content of this uh, soot. And it just gets in the way of light. It blocks light, making it fainter. And it also, because of the optical properties of the dust grains, makes the blue light get blocked out more than the red light. And so we call this reddening, but it's probably more physically accurately called deblueening. But you can see why reddening is appreciated. So that stars that are behind a screen of dust appear redder than they are, because not because there's more red light, but because there's less blue light associated with them. So for we treat this by amending our formula. Uh, this is a magnitude relation with the distance modulus uh, variable. So this looked like m, little m is big M plus five log D. And then what we do is we tack on a measure of the extinction and we just measure it in magnitudes. We say there's such and such measure of magnitudes of extinction uh, between us and the star. So we stick on a touch of extinction. So uh, given that, we can uh, just uh, we can figure out how much extinction is there by the amount of reddening, and so the you know the redder the stars are, the more extinction there is, and then the optical properties of the grain relate the change in color to the amount of extinction that we have, uh, and so we express the change in color of a star in terms of what's called its color excess. And that's just because more positive colors tend to are set up to be redder. And so we write this down as this E B minus V, color excess. And what we do is we take the observed value of a B minus V and we subtract off the true value. So this is it has more color, which just means it's redder uh, than that. And so a positive color excess is a measure of how much B band extinction there is versus V band. So remember that the B band is to the blue of the V band. So B is bluish colors and V is kind of yellowish colors. Uh, so we know the true colors of stars pretty well. So we know the B minus V true for a star. And so we can use the properties of the stars to infer the reddening and then relate that to the extinction or by proxy, just sort of filter based on uh, the reddening. And that's uh, what happened in the Gaia papers. They just didn't try treat reddening. They found the stuff with low reddening. All right, so I should note here that we are in epoll code JID um, here. Uh, I'll put that, in, you, know, you can put that in chat. Oh, somebody or his. Thank you very much. Uh, and so we'll open up this e-poll because we want to ask the question, if a star has a parallax of 10 milli arc seconds, an absolute magnitude in the V-band of minus three, and two magnitudes of dust extinction, again in the V-band, what is its apparent magnitude?
All right, give you, let that run for a little while. I'm gonna switch screens here uh, to, 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 uh, to bring up the vitals on this particular problem. So we have a star parallax of 10 milli arc seconds, V band absolute magnitude of minus three, and two uh, magnitudes of extinction. We want to know what its apparent magnitude is. And so that's you know basically, oh man, this, what a great formula. Just stick everything in here. So negative three for the V band, five log 10. Oh, what's the distance? If it's 10 milli arc seconds, the distance is just going to be uh, one arc second over 0 0.01 arc seconds times one parsec. That's 100 parsecs, yeah, and so it's 100 parsecs over 10 parsecs plus AV of 2 is negative 3. 100 over 10 is a factor of 10. Log base 10 of 10 is 1, so that goes to 1. So it's minus 3 plus 5 plus 2, and so this comes out to be plus 4. All right, let's see how we did. I'm seeing... Oh. Lots of fours and all over the place. Awesome. Any questions on that setup? Cool, cool. Rolling on. All right. Um, okay. So given that, the Gaia article filters on extinction. And it basically filters on extinction by choosing a color excess that is less than 0.015 magnitudes. And you can see that down in this little caption, low extinction, and they define it based on how much it reddens, not based on the extinction, but the two are related. And when you do that, we get this exquisite looking Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, where what you see here is the main feature is the um, main sequence running up in the diagonal band. You see white dwarfs, you see a red giant branch, you see a brilliant red clump, more on all that on Wednesday. Uh, but we get this exquisite HR diagram in the Gaia bands, uh, set up so nicely. So that's the big kind of results of this section. And then they move on into section three. Uh, and in section three of the article, this is still kind of part of the methods, but they kind of change scope of the article. Ch section two was all about building a good clean sample and doing the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And then they move over to identify clusters. And then they talk about how they establish their identification of star clusters. And this should start to look a lot like what we did two Fridays ago when we got uh, dove in and sort of filtered out and found the Pleiades in uh, a data set using this proper motion filtering technique. So they'll mention some of that in here and discuss how they identify the clusters. They move in and discuss how they're finding two different types of clusters. Um, one is called the open clusters. These are nearby young clusters of stars, and they sort of filter out how they go about that in section 3.2. Then they talk about globular clusters, which are these massive relic of galaxy formation clusters uh, that, you know, they happen to have some near us that we can measure their properties, and they sort of filter out how they get it. They go ahead and note that a lot of the details of the filtering are in this other article, Gaia Collaboration 2018C. And if you want to read that, you actually have to go and look up the article in the references and then go find it to find find out what the details are. So this gives us a setup for the article. And for Friday, I uh, would like for you to read through the abstract and sections one through three of the Gaia collaboration paper on Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams. We've given you the tools you need to find it. It's actually linked off of eClass, so if you just want to download it directly. And then what we'll be doing for part of Friday is I'm going to give you some questions via an eClass quiz that will count as part of your participation 
question marks. Uh, so if you miss it, the part doesn't matter you're there. And then we'll actually group up into breakout rooms on Zoom and kind of do this. So like you don't have to read it beforehand, but it will help you navigate through and participate with your group as you go through and frame some of these discussions. I'm just going to ask you a bit about uh, some of the reading. Uh, so in preparation for that, there is on uh, Discord a uh, art, uh, channel called The Gaia Article. Uh, so if you have questions about the article, like, how does this work? What's going on here? I don't get what this chi-squared over new thing is. Um, go ahead and post them there. And then after we do a bit of stars and stellar populations, we're going to come back and read sections four through seven to get a full view of this. And so that'll give us basically, you know, I'm going to be telling you all this stuff in lecture and I'm just taking it from this, you know, these articles and ones like that. So this is where a lot of these pieces are coming from. And one of the objectives I have in doing this exercise is trying to boot, bootstrap up this connection. So you're not scared to say, all right, what's all this stuff? Like the stuff we're doing here is really right there at the, like, this is, you know, has great contact with research. And I just want to point out what that is. And so by making you go and explore the research, you can see that, you know, it's pretty close to what we're covering here in this class. All right, uh, any closing questions on the exercise, the questions about journal articles, how we set all extinction up? I'm gonna prepare to pivot to telescopes. None of my channels are kicking stuff up, so let's move on back to telescopes. All right, I'm not gonna go too much into the properties of telescopes. There's a fine art to using it um, that some of us are still trying to master, uh, but it's you should just sort of know the boundary conditions of like what telescopes do to observations. They're limitations on what we know about the universe. And every time we build new telescopes, like Gaia, we get new insights into the universe. And so we think about telescopes in terms of two key uh, properties, the angular resolution and the sensitivity of the telescope. Uh, and I think I should probably add a third kind of overarching uh, which is the wavelength coverage of the telescope. But within a given wave band or wavelength coverage of the telescope, we're going to sort of think about what's the angular resolution and the sensitivity. And both of these things depend on how big the telescope is. Uh, so these are two telescopes you see here. On the uh, left, you see the uh, James Webb Space Telescope, which has been spattered all over the news lately because it launched in December and is currently deploying to the Lagrange 2 point uh, outside the moon's orbit for what looks to be about a decade worth of observations. Uh, so it's awesome, but when we talk about the size of James Webb, it's this diameter right here, indicated with D. For angular resolution, the... Uh, thing that matters is the maximum size of the optical uh, element. And so for James Webb, yeah, that's easy. It's that far across, thereabouts. Um, and you measure kind of edge to edge. That's kind of sets the best case for angular resolution. But for something like a radio interferometer, like this is the VLA, one of my other, these are like my two favorite telescopes right now. Uh, this telescope uh, here, what matters for interferometry is the separation between the in, the elements that are contributing to this. Now that I look at this, I don't know what this guy's doing right here. He's off in the other direction. Doesn't work. Antenna 27 doesn't work. So maybe I should go to here. Uh, anyways, so this is the separation between the elements. And that's what matters for the angular resolution because it is essentially is asking an interference criterion. And so this is functionally the kind of slit width in a two slit experiment, which is basically how far apart are your two uh, components of your optical elements. And if you did that, you get that the angular resolution is going to be set by an angle in radians 
of the wavelength over this separation uh, between the optical element, the widest extent between the optical elements. So what is optical resolution? Well, that's uh, a um, uh, property of the smallest scale structure in an image that you can discern. And so for an image like this, this is a Hubble Space Telescope 475W image, so 475 nanometers, thereabouts. And this shows a star field in my favorite galaxy, M33. And what it is, is we have the native resolution over here on the left, which has an angular resolution. You put in the numbers, it comes out to be about 0.1 arc seconds. Hubble's 2.2 uh, 2 meter dish, a 475 nanometer wavelength. You stick that in, convert it to arc seconds, you get about 0.1 arc seconds. And that's the actual scale of the structures here. And so if you look at something like this little blip right here, it's about a tenth of an arc second across. If I put the angular scale on the vertical axis, you could measure that off. Uh, if you have a good ground-based telescope, the typical resolution is set by the properties of the atmosphere in the optical. And so that gives you an angular resolution that's typically about half an arc second. And that, you can see, it sort of blurs things out. And then if you have a, like, seeing in Edmonton, you get an angular resolution of about one arc second. So it's the same field in sort of three different angular resolutions. And you kind of want good angular resolution because it gives you two things. First, you can tell faint things from bright things, especially when they're near each other. If you look at a blob like this in the coarse image, uh, poor resolution, you can sort of see that it's two stars here. And if you look in the Hubble Space Telescope, it's actually three stars, one, two, three, and a bunch of small, fainter stars in the area around it. So the better the angular resolution, the more information you get about uh, a, you know, a field. So we love that. So uh, yeah, question came up in chat. Uh, the smaller value of theta, the better the resolution. Yes, so angular resolution is one of those numbers where tiny is good. Uh, smaller details. And so you think about uh, distances uh, or projected distances, smaller angles times farther distances allows you to resolve the same structure in more distant targets or resolve smaller structures in, more, in the same uh, nearby target. So that's uh, you know, a thing. So angular resolution, tiny equals better. Okay. Um, the other thing that matters is the size of the tele uh, uh, collecting area. So that sets the sensitivity of the telescope. And this matters uh, because uh, you actually have to pay attention to the optical elements, not how far apart they are. And so for something like Webb over here, you just say, okay, it's a single solid aperture, and we can sort of, if we approximate this as a circle, we can just say, oh, it's pi times d squared over four. That gives me the area. That's the size of my light bucket. I catch that much light that comes in, focuses up here on the secondary, and goes into all those lovely instruments down there. In contrast, something like the VLA has 27 telescopes, each with a smaller, uh, diameter, and so you would actually count up the area. So you can see that the VLA has amazing angular resolution, but its light gathering power, its sensitivity is going to kind of be worse than a single telescope that spans this entire area, because essentially you've taken a giant telescope and then blocked out a bunch of the area and basically reduced its sensitivity by that amount. So this is a case where the area of the telescope is uh, bigger is better because uh, you catch more light here. And we did the exercise with how much power do you detect. Your instruments set or you know, measure a real power level. And so if you have a larger area and the same flux density coming in, uh, you will catch more power uh, in your telescope than if you had a smaller telescope. So that's just because the electronics that are reading things out are sensitive to the power. And therefore, if you gather more power per unit area, by having a larger area, you get a better sensitivity to astronomical sources. All right, so let's go ahead and use uh, this e-poll question. Uh, JWST will operate in the near infrared. It has a diameter of 6.5 meters. What's the angular resolution of the telescope at two microns? Express your answer in arc seconds. All 
So I'll just note as a sideline, this is a very relevant value to me because uh, I am uh, really looking forward to uh, collecting some data on the James Webb Telescope this summer. Uh, it was, uh, we put in a successful proposal here and uh, are going to hopefully be getting data in a few months. So good times. And so, yeah, we're one of the things we're studying is my favorite galaxy at two microns. So I'm excited about that. All right, looks like we have answers coming in. I'll leave it open uh, here. So to calculate the angular resolution, we use this lambda over maximum extent of the optical collecting area or the optical surface. Uh, so point to point edge, which is for JWST, fortunately always uh, the same as the value that we use for the collecting area. Don't have to think too hard. So then we say that the angular resolution is the wavelength is two microns. So we stick that in as two times 10 to the minus six meters. And then we divide that by the aperture, which is 6.5 meters. And then it will get an answer in radians. And I can say, all right, well, there are 206265 arc seconds per one radian, which you can calculate out pi over 180 times 60 times 60, um, 180 over pi times 60 times 60. Uh, and if we do this, I got an answer of 0 0.063 arc seconds. Uh, let's see what you got. Yeah, seems like some good agreement in 0 0.063 not too far off. Uh, so this value is excellent. Uh, for reference, the best angular resolution images we have at two microns uh, of uh, M33, or basically anything uh, so far, is about one and a half arc seconds. So we're going to be going factors of 20 to 30 times better. And you're going to get basically images that look, go from looking like this for targets to looking like this. It's kind of that scale or better improvement in the angular resolution of what we're going to be seeing for these targets in the infrared. So it's it's really excellent collecting area. We don't have, we've never launched a satellite with this good of collecting area at this wavelength range. And Andy, this is the largest spin. Anyway, and it's um uh, we're going to have exquisite angular resolution. So this is this is why the nerds like me are just like it, everybody is. But you know we're really excited about this because it's this generational improvement in the quality of the instrumentation. Oops. All right, that's that. Questions. 
Um, we're about to change to our final topic of the day, which is stars. Got nothing. All right. Stars. Oop, don't look at that. It's secret. Okay. It's not secret. I've posted preview slides. Oh, the other thing is that I consolidated all of our lecture slides into a single folder on eClass instead of kind of posting them randomly uh, throughout. It just seems sane. You know, I'm good with that. All right, uh, the next thing that we're going to cover in class is the topic of stars uh, and stellar populations. And I've broken this up into two chapters in the book. We'll do kind of a quick introduction to stars and uh, sort of all of the language that comes with it. And then we'll go on and pick up stellar populations. And while stars is kind of context, a lot like observations, stellar populations is kind of where I view the main material in Astro 320 beginning. So like we, what we've done up to now, including the stars content, is very much a kind of introduction and sort of content. And now we're finally ready to start grappling with, like after we finish this, we'll be ready to start grappling with galaxies and the constituents of galaxies in detail viewed through this observational lens. So stars, because we have these two other courses, 320, 465, there's excellent content that actually outlines this as physics. We're going to sort of regard this as a black box, which is we're going to feed in some physics at one end and have stuff that comes out. And that's because we have this amazing theory of stellar structure and evolution that allows us to say, okay, this stuff becomes a star and now I know everything that does over the course of its lifetime with good detail. Our theory is quite good, quite predictive in the nature of what's happening with stars. Uh, and so in the next few lectures, uh, we'll be covering basic stellar structure and physical processes. If you've taken 320, you're going to be like, okay, this is all a review. But there are people who haven't taken 320 in this class. And so I just kind of want to give you the touch points that you need to make the connections to the material. Then we'll talk about the observed stellar properties, probably a little more than you saw in 320, because this is what we see with our telescopes. We'll, of course, then focus on the Hertz von Russell diagram because what's a class in Astro without the HR diagram. Uh, then we'll focus on stellar winds and supernova. Again, something you may not have actually explored too much in 320 if you've seen it. But, but it's very important for galaxies and galaxy evolution. So we'll discuss that. And then finally, we'll sort of come back to these things that are called evolutionary tracks, which is how things evolve in their properties over the course of their lives. And things here means stars. Okay. Um, so sorry for the walls of text, but you know, here's what we got. So the uh, key properties of stars are that they have, um, we, we, we focus on kind of four things tell us about what stars are. Uh, we care about their initial mass and stars usually we treat as having an initial mass from this 0 0.08 solar masses up to twiddle 300 solar masses. Uh, and that's the initial mass, as we'll learn the mass of these stars, particularly the high mass end, can change dramatically over their lifetime. Then we care about their chemical composition. And for stars, the chemical composition, when we're dealing in stellar structure, is described by mass fraction. And we use these dimensionless variables, x, y, and z, to describe the content of a star. x is hydrogen, so x times the mass of the object is how much of that mass is hydrogen. And that's typically 72 to 75% of the mass of an object is hydrogen. Uh, stars, galaxy, pretty much everything but like you and planet Earth. Uh, y is helium. Uh, helium is typically 25 to 26% of uh, the mass in an object. And then Z is metals, which is literally everything else. We like, you know, I, I like to explain this to my chemistry colleagues at uh, department meetings just to watch them twitch a little bit. It's like, the, you know, their, their eyelids kind of, you know, get a little, like, it, it's clear that we're causing damage by pointing out that everything except for hydrogen and helium is a metal, but that's just the way we kind of treat stuff in astrophysics. It's a good, clean fun, right? Hey, whatever. Anyways, but this is zero to about 2% of the material in a star is everything else. 
Uh, the other uh, things that we'll care about is whether the star is located in a binary or a uh, multiple stellar system. We care about whether they have, like, friends uh, bound together in a gravitationally bound system. And then uh, to a lesser degree, which we won't talk about too much in this class, we also care about what the initial angular momentum of the system is. So basically, how fast is the star uh, spinning? Uh, we, we need to know what the anatomy of a star is very briefly. Uh, so stars are, stars are round. Look at the, actually don't look at the sun, but take my word for it. Stars are nearly spherical. Uh, they're made of gas and they generate energy through, at some point in their life through nuclear fusion. Maybe not at the beginning or the end, but at some point they're, li they're getting nuclear energy through, the, uh, through nuclear fusion of hydrogen. Um, a star has kind of uh, three basic parts that we'll care about. The core is that central fusion engine where we actually have uh, the reactions going on. That's where hydrogen goes into helium and all the later stages of fusion happen. And then that has an envelope, which is the material around it that's largely inert with respect to the nuclear fusion processes. And then what we care about a lot in this class is the photosphere, because the photosphere here is just the outer layer of the star. That is where the uh, light flows out of the surface of the star into space, and therefore it sets the observed properties of uh, the star. The essential stellar physics of a star is, uh, has to do, uh, we, we, the, the, the essential physics of this, uh, the, by far the most important part of uh, stellar structure is the feature called hydrostatic equilibrium which is a balance between the gradient of pressure for a star and its self-gravity. So pressure gradient pushes, uh, it keeps material from falling inward. And you can twiddle out, and do so in the book, the required pressure support to uh, support the star against gravity has this magnitude of big G, I don't know why I'm pointing there, this big G uh, times the mass of the star M squared, over the radius to the fourth power. This is a twiddle, so there's a numerical prefactor in here to get it just right. But this basically says that if a star is going to be prevented from collapsing, something, we don't know what, but something has to show up to provide pressure support against gravity. There's just the mass in the star. The mass in the star. It's going to pull the material in unless something stops it. What is it? Well, in stars, it can be usually one of three things, and sometimes it's not supported. That's how you get black holes. But uh, the pressure support is provided through three channels, gas pressure, radiation pressure, or this spooky quantum mechanical uh, pressure uh, from the Pauli exclusion principle call, that we call degeneracy pressure. Uh, that's specific to astronomy. Even physicists have a different name for degeneracy pressure. The gas pressure uh, is from you know, perfect gas law. Hot gases exert pressure. And in this class, we'll use a perfect gas law that looks a lot like this. P equals little n kT, which, uh, I don't know, there's about seven different flavors of the gas law with moles and R's and uh, even number of particles and so on. Here, little n is the number density of particles. And I think that's what's sort of unique around here. So that n, I should note, is the number density of particles. So this is the number density of protons, electrons, molecules, whatever. This is the number density. So it's just number per unit volume. Uh, K is Boltzmann's constant. And then T is the temperature measured in kelvins. Uh, the radiation pressure uh, shows up here because the radiation pressure is uh, shows up because light carries momentum. Uh, you know, the energy of light is related to the momentum that it carries. And things that carry momentum and can sort of dump that momentum into uh, objects will exert forces. And so we can figure out that light will actually exert a force on. If you put light in the container, it'll exert a force on uh, the wall. And uh, the uh, expression for the radiation pressure is 4 times sigma Sb, that's the Stefan Boltzmann constant, uh, over 3C times temperature to the fourth. And the astute uh, 
observers here will note that this is actually the same t to the fourth, sigma t to the fourth, that shows up in the Stefan-Boltzmann law. This is a thermal radiation uh, approximation. So if we have thermal radiation spectrum, then the radiation pressure is going to be uh, uh, follow this expression. Finally, there's this thing that's called degeneracy pressure. And I'm not going to go into degeneracy pressure in a great deal. It's a lovely derivation. One of my top... It's probably number eight on my favorite derivations in astrophysics, uh, but it's it's right up there. And uh, the degeneracy pressure is just a constant times rho to the five thirds. Constant's complicated, it's great. Uh, but the important point about this, which I'll write in red letters, is does not depend on temperature. Does not depend on which is kind of cool because that just means that you don't have to maintain a temperature. If something is uh, supported by this degenerative pressure, it just holds itself up by being there. These other two do depend on temperature, and that becomes important because that leads us to stellar evolution. Okay, uh, last thing we'll do today. Uh, let's explore a couple of these pressure relations. So, I want to know what's the number density of particles in a standard room, which I'm going to have a temperature of 17 degrees C at standard atmospheric pressure. Uh-oh. What's a physics unit for a standard atmospheric pressure? Somebody hit me up in chat. One atmosphere. Yeah. What is that in SI units? There it is, 101.325 pascals, or 100 kilopascals. Yep, so P gas in a standard room, because we're under one atmosphere, is 101.325 pascals. And you might remember that a pascal is a Newton per meter squared. So from there, yeah, roll with it. We can use our perfect gas law to figure out the number density of particles. Uh-oh. I realize we are coming up to the minutes. Since we're short on time, I'm just kind of working it out here. I encourage you to do the same. All right, and when I plug all that in, I get 2.5 times 10 to the 25 particles per meter cubed. So there's a lot of, a lot of particles hanging out in your average room. Okay, uh, I'm going to wrap things up. I'll leave the e-poll open for a couple minutes, but we're done here. I'll see you on Wednesday where we'll cover sort of the rest of, uh, not the rest of stars, but a solid chunk more stars. See you all later. Thanks for dialing in. And uh, this will get posted along with lecture real soon. Thanks for coming.